Wormwood, yes. A period of sexual temptation is an excellent time for working in a subordinate attack on the patient's irritability. It may even be the main attack, so long as he thinks it is a subordinate one. But here, as in everything else, you must prepare the way for your moral attack by darkening his intellect. Men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury, and the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. Thus, the more claims on life your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured, and as a result, ill-tempered. Now you will have noticed that nothing throws him into a passion so easily as to find that some time which he reckoned on having as his own being suddenly taken from him. It is the visitor when he looked forward to a quiet evening, or the friend's talkative wife when he so looked forward to a tete-a-tete -tete with the friend that throw him out of gear. Now he is not yet so unkind or lazy that these small demands on his courtesy are too much for it. But they anger him because he feels that his time is his own and that it is being stolen. You must therefore zealously guard in his mind this curious supposition, my time is my own. Let him feel that he starts each day as the lawful owner of 24 hours. Let him feel as a grievous tax that portion which he gives over to his employers, and as a generous donation that portion which he allows for religious duties. But never let him feel that the total from which these were deducted was anything other than his own personal birthright. You have here a delicate task. The assumption which you want him to go on making is so absurd that, if it is once questioned, even we cannot find a shred of argument for it. The man can neither make nor retain one moment of time. It has all come to him by pure gift. He might as well regard the sun and moon as his own personal slaves. He is also, in theory, in the direct service of the enemy, and if the enemy were to appear to him in bodily form and demand that total service for at least one day, he would not refuse. He would be greatly relieved if that one day involved nothing harder than listening to the conversation of a foolish woman, and he would be relieved almost to the pitch of disappointment if the enemy were to say to him for half hour on that day, now you may go and amuse yourself. Now, if he thinks about his assumptions for even a moment, even he must realize that he is in this situation every day. When I speak of preserving this assumption in his mind, therefore, the last thing I want you to do is furnish him with arguments in the defense of it. There aren't any. Your task is purely negative. Don't let his thoughts come anywhere near the subject. Wrap a darkness about it, and in the center of that darkness, let his sense of ownership in time lie silent, dormant. But operative. The sense of ownership in general is always to be encouraged. The humans are always putting up claims to ownership which sound equally funny in heaven and in hell, and we must keep them doing so. Much of the modern resistance to chastity comes from the human belief that they own their bodies. Those vast and perilous estates, pulsating with the energy that made the worlds, in which they find themselves without their consent, and from which they are ejected at the pleasure of another. It is as if a royal child, whom her father has placed, for love's sake, in titular command of some great province, but under the real rule of wise counselors, should come to believe that she really owns the cities and the towns and the corn in the same way as she owns the blocks on her nursery floor. We produce this sense of ownership not only by pride, but also by confusion. We teach them not to notice the different senses of the possessive pronoun, the finely graded differences which run from my boots through my dog, my servant, my wife, my father, my master, my country, all the way to my god. They can be taught to reduce all these senses to that of my boots, the my of ownership. Even in the nursery, a child can be taught to mean by my teddy bear, not that old imagined recipient of affection with whom I have a special relation, which is what the enemy will teach them to mean by it if we are not careful, but rather, the bear I can pull to pieces if I like. At the other end of the scale, we have taught people to say my god in a sense not really that different from my boots, meaning the god on whom I have a claim for my distinguished services and whom I exploit from the pulpit. The god whom I have done a corner in. And all the time, the joke is that no human being can say mine in its fully possessive sense of anything. In the long run, either our father or the enemy will say mine of every single thing that exists, and especially of each person. They will find out, don't you worry, to whom their time, their souls, and their bodies really belong. Certainly not to them. At the moment, the enemy says mine of everything on the pedantic and legalistic ground that he made it. In the end, our father hopes to say mine of all things on the more dynamic and realistic ground of conquest. Mm -hmm.